the first thing I would like to do, um, and I'm actually kind of doing this in the way that I normally would not do it, um, is to reveal my sources, <laughs> right? So to say where I got a lot of my information. Um, Stephen Greenblatt is actually the, um, one of the world's uh, leading scholars on Shakespeare. And um, so I drew quite a bit of information from his book, Will in the World, which is a really fascinating book, and it's actually a good read. You know, sometimes you read academic type books and they're really boring. This one's actually really interesting. So if you've read things like Devil in the White City by Eric Larson, um, this is a similarly good read. Um, and, and it's all about what scholars know about Shakespeare's childhood. I also drew from the introduction to Midsummer Night's Dream that appears in the Norton Shakespeare. And it was also written by Stephen Greenblatt. <laughs> so, so as you can tell, he, he is definitely someone to listen to um, when it comes to matters pertaining to Shakespeare. Yes? Where is he from? What nation? Country? You know, that's a, a good question. And in fact, that was one that I was wondering. Harvard. He is American. He is the author of The Swerve, How the World Became Modern, and he's won the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. Yeah, he is, he is a big deal. Um, I also used uh, Shakespeare for Students, Critical Interpretations of Shakespeare's Plays and Poetry, um, edited by Anne-Marie Hatch. And I pulled from some other sources too, but those are my three main ones. Um, so I, I just want to start with a little bit about the origin of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Right. Um, scholars don't know the original year that this particular play was written. But many scholars um, identify the play as having been written between 1594 and 1596. So A Midsummer Night's Dream would have been one of Shakespeare's earlier works. And scholars also believe that he was working on A Midsummer Night's Dream at about the same time that he was writing Romeo and Juliet which I think is fascinating <laughs> for a whole variety of reasons. And so as I talk more about Midsummer today, um, part of what I will try to do is to point out some of the parallels um, with Romeo and Juliet, which is, I'm guessing, something that we've probably all seen and or read multiple times, <laughs> right? Um, I'm going to make a, a rather big claim and, and state that I think A Midsummer Night's Dream is probably Shakespeare's most successful comedy. Um, since its inception. Now, I can't really say that it was the most successful comedy during the Elizabethan era, because scholars don't know that. <laughs> they don't know exactly how many productions of A Midsummer Night's Dream were put on during Shakespeare's era. But what scholars do know is that in the first quarto, right, which was a collection of plays um, that was published um, after Shakespeare's death, that what the first quarto said was that Midsummer Night's Dream hath been sundry times publicly acted in London. So in other words, this is not a play that went up once, <laughs> right? And then was not repeated due to poor reception, right? This was a play that went up many times. Now, since the Renaissance, right, the play's inception, there have been many, many many productions right, that have gone on. There have been musical scores that have been created for Midsummer Night's Dream. There is a ballet, right? And it, to give you guys an idea of how often this particular play is put on at the Chicago Shakespeare Theater, right? There was a full production, a main stage production of the Midsummer Night's Dream that went up in 2012. And there is another main stage production of Midsummer Night's Dream going up in 2019, <laughs> just a few years later, right? So again, back to my central claim that this is one of, if not the most successful comedy that Shakespeare wrote. And, and so to give you an idea of some of the highlights, right, of what has happened with this play over time, Felix Mendelssohn wrote a, an overture for Midsummer Night's Dream in 1826. And then he actually expanded it in 1842, right? So there is actually music written by Mendelssohn for this particular play. And then in 1876, that's when um, a ballet version came out and uh, more music was added to Mendelssohn's compositions 
by Leon Minkus. All right. Um, there are other musical versions that came out in the 19th and 20th centuries. And um, although I think Mendelssohn's is really the, the one that is worth mentioning, the most recent version I found um, was recently performed at the Lyric Opera in Chicago for two performances only. Oh. And I thought, well, with a title like Midsummer Night's Dream, why would there only be two performances, right? They surely, well, then I started watching clips of this production, and I just have to be honest with you and say it looked weird. <laughs> uh, there, were, <laughs> there were actors dressed in superhero costumes, and the music sounded very Philip Glass, shall we say. So, but this production, um, again, it was at the Lyric in April 2018, I believe it was created in 2016, if I remember correctly. So this is a play where musicians, artists, continue to transform it, to create new music for it, they continue to work with it. Um, this play also has uh, appeared on television and in film. And one of the earliest versions that appeared on television that I found uh, was actually performed by the Beatles in 1964. And it was not the full Midsummer Night's Dream. What it was, was um, Pyramus and Thisbe. So in, within a Midsummer Night's Dream, there is a play within a play. So a very short play that's performed at the end of Midsummer Night's Dream, and it was actually the play within a play that was performed by the Beatles in 1964. <laughs> in 1968, a film version of the play was done by the Royal Shakespeare Company, which starred Diana Rigg as Helena, Helen Mirren as Hermia, Ian Holm as Puck, and Judi Dench as Titania. So quite the cast. Another Royal Shakespeare Company version was filmed by the Arts Council of England and released in the theaters in 1996. And then there was a star-studded 1999 film version of the play starring Kevin Klein as Bottom, Stanley Tucci as Puck, Michelle Pfeiffer as Titania, and Christian Bale as Demetrius. And so some very big name actors uh, were attracted to this particular film version. And this is just another interesting factoid that supports what a popular, right, kind of wildly successful play this is. The Royal Shakespeare Company has done six productions of A Midsummer Night's Dream in the early 21st century alone. <laughs> six, right? So this is a play that people keep coming back to, right? Artists and audiences alike. So one of my questions that I had as I was researching for this particular presentation was, well, why on earth is, is this play so popular, right? What is it about it that resonates with people? And before I start posing some possible answers to that question, right, why is this play so popular? I want to just first talk about the plot. I think with Shakespeare, no matter how, if you guys are like me, right, um, maybe you've seen this before, maybe you've read it, but I feel like every time I see a, a production of Romeo and Juliet, I'm watching it for the first time. You know, I've seen Midsummer Night's Dream, I don't know how many times. And um, just as I was watching the festival production, I felt like I was watching it for the first time, mm -hmm. right? Oftentimes there are so many characters, so many plot details, that it really is as if you're experiencing it for the first time, no matter how many times you've seen it. That's how I feel anyway. So what I would like to do is to just provide a little info about plot. And maybe this information is, um, a kind of refresher, right? For some of you, maybe it's brand new, I don't know. Midsummer Night's Dream, for me, is structured around a series of problems, all right? And it is also structured around three separate groups of characters. So before I start talking about the problems that come up in Midsummer Night's Dream, I want to talk about the different sets of characters, all right? So first of all, we have the, uh, what, what are referred to by Puck as the rude mechanicals, all right? So the rude mechanicals are people who work with their hands. These are artisans, weavers, right? So in other words, if, if we're thinking about the construction of a play, right? These are the people who work behind the scenes to create the set and so on and so forth, right? Then we also have the upper classes and the nobility represented, right? Now, sometimes when, when scholars talk about Midsummer Night's Dream, they do so a little bit sloppily because they will say that all of the characters in the upper classes are the nobility, but that's incorrect, right? When we're thinking about Elizabethan England, 
the nobles were actually people born with um, with specific titles, right, like baron or duke, right, and these titles could be conferred by either the king or queen alone. <laughs> so in other words, not just anybody could become hmm. a noble. And there is a duke that appears in Midsummer Night's Dream, right, as well as Hippolyta, the Amazonian queen. So the nobility, right, as well as the court are represented. But then um, other characters within this group, they're just wealthy, right? So people like Aegeus, Demetrius, um, Lysander, Hermia, and Helena are all wealthy characters, but they're not necessarily the nobility, all right? So that's one group of people. We have the nobles, we have the wealthy. And then we have uh, the mechanics, right? The people who work with their hands. And then we have this third really fascinating and wonderful group, the fairies, right? So these are ethereal creatures. They are otherworldly. They cannot be explained away by science or human understanding, mm -hmm. right? So characters like Puck, Oberon, Titania are all the fairies, right? And the play is really quite fascinating insofar as there are distinct sections with these groups of characters. So as you watch the first, well, I think what's being presented at festival as the first act, right, you'll see one scene with the nobles slash upper classes, followed by another scene with the rude mechanicals, right, followed by another scene with the fairies. And these three groups of characters do have interaction Right, and their actions impact one another. So those are the three groups of characters. Now we'll get to the problems. Right? The first problem pertains to the wealthy group, right, the nobility. Aegeus is a wealthy man who wants his daughter Hermia to marry Demetrius. But his daughter Hermia is actually in love with another character called Lysander. Right? So in other words, Hermia wants to marry a man of her choosing, but Daddy is saying no. <laughs> All right, so that's problem number one. So Dad doesn't know what to do with his daughter. So he goes to the Duke, Duke Theseus, and says, Theseus, please help me, right, in terms of solving this particular problem. And Theseus sides with the father. Theseus says to his daughter Hermia, if you want to marry Lysander, you may not, right? but you may join a convent if you don't want to join Demetrius in marriage. And actually, Hermia says, all right, I'll join the convent. Well, that's what she says, but what she does is actually quite different. Hermia's proposed solution is to flee the city of Athens, right, which is where uh, this particular play takes place, and enter the woods so that she and Lysander may go to a nearby relatives, right, and marry outside of the law of Athens. That's her solution. Helena's proposed solution, Helena is another character who is actually in love with Demetrius, the man that Aegeus wants his daughter to marry. But Demetrius doesn't love Helena. And so her solution to this problem is to actually tell Demetrius where Hermia and Lysander are going. Right? And she thinks, well, if I can help Demetrius, right, then perhaps he will see how helpful and sweet, right, and, and caring I am, and he will fall in love with me instead of Hermia, all right? So even if you didn't follow all the specific details of what's going on with these four young people, right, because it's, it's kind of complicated, um, I think the important point to know right, is that there's a, a kind of love square, <laughs> right, between four people, young people, and they go off into the woods, all right? So that's one problem. The second major problem has to do with the realm of the fairies. And so here, fairy queen Titania and fairy king Oberon, they've been fighting, all right? And the fairy queen has stolen a boy from India, and, um, she is infatuated with him. And King Oberon wants to, his wife Titania to hand the Indian boy over to him. And Titania says no. So what you'll notice between these first two problems, right, is that we have two uncooperative, uncooperative women. 
right? Two. One is human, the other is a fairy. And when you think about Romeo and Juliet, right? Is Juliet very cooperative with her parents? Not at all. Right, so this is a, a rather distinct parallel between these two particular plays. And what happens with these uncooperative women is really quite interesting in this particular play. Right, so um, the will of the woman, right, which we in, in uh, academia, we sometimes call this uh, generals, right, the will of the woman during the Elizabethan era is something that Shakespeare was thinking about, I believe, as he was working on the Midsummer Night's Dream and Romeo and Juliet. So at any rate, Oberon doesn't know what to do with his uncooperative wife. Just as in the human realm, right, where the man is supposed to be the decision maker, right, he's supposed to be the one in power, the woman is to submit. Um, just as in the human realm, in the fairy land, things are supposed to run in basically the same way. And so what to do about problematic Titania? Well, his solution is to put love potion on her eyes so that she might, or so that he might rather, um, in the words of, of Oberon, make her full of hateful fantasies. All right? So what this love potion is going to do is that it's going to make her fall in love with whoever it is that she happens to see when she opens her eyes. All right? And so what he's trying to do is to direct her attentions away from the boy from India so that he can get the Indian boy away and get her, her attention and affection back. The third major problem, like I said, this play is full of problems, um, pertains to the group of the wealthy characters and the nobility. Um, Oberon learns of Helena's unrequited love for Demetrius, and he intervenes. All right, so what he decides to do is to, this is the fairy king, bear in mind, is that he decides to give uh, some of this love potion he's going to use for Titania. He's going to give it to um, a character named Robin Goodfellow, whom we probably all know as Puck. Right? <laughs> and so, and he tells Puck, I want you to take this love potion and put it on Demetrius's eyes when Helena is around, and then when he wakes up, he will see Helena and be in love with her. And then that will solve this whole problem, right, of the young people um, loving the wrong parents and so on and so forth. Well, the problem is that Puck gets confused and puts the love potion on Lysander's eyes, so the wrong young man. And when Lysander wakes up, it is Helena that he falls in love with, and he has forgotten about her man. <laughs> right? Um, the fourth major problem pertains to the group of characters called the Mechanicals. They are planning an amateur production of something called Pyramus and Thisbe. Right, which is basically like Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> the play within a play in Midsummer Night's Dream is just like Romeo and Juliet. Um, it's two characters who talk to one another through a wall, right? And um, they're talking, they're falling in love, and um, what happens with these characters is that uh, they arrange to meet in person. And uh, I believe it is Pyramus. Um, whom Thisbe believes when they meet in person that uh, Pyramus has been killed by a lion, right? And so then Thisbe kills himself, and then when um, when Pyramus, or no, 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 herself, sorry. And then when Pyramus wakes up, he discovers, oh no, my lover is gone, and then commits suicide as well. So deep parallels with, with Romeo and Juliet there. <laughs> so at any rate, they're planning to put on an amateur production of Pyramus and Thisbe, the uh, mechanicals are, um, for their duke which was a common practice during the Elizabethan era. So in other words, it absolutely happened where a group of amateur performers would say, well, let's put on a play for our duke, right? The duke is the landowner, right? And so what the mechanicals are doing in Midsummer Night's Dream by planning to put on this production for the duke's wedding is something that was done frequently in, a, in Elizabethan England. The problem with this production is that it's awful. Um, and the, the mechanicals don't know what they're doing. And the character Bottom wants to play all of the roles. He's a terrible actor, but he wants to play all of the roles. All right, well, Puck, the character Puck, right, he's one of the fairies, he comes across Bottom and is just appalled, right, by how terrible Bottom is as a performer. 
And what he decides to do then is to turn Bottom into a donkey, but the language that's used in the play is ass, <laughs> right? And it comes up multiple times throughout Midsummer Night's Dream. And so Donkey then is transformed into a creature. And Oberon, right, the fairy king, has gone and put love potion on the fairy queen's eyes, and guess who she sees when she wakes up? The donkey. <laughs> And so this is much of the source of humor, right, in Midsummer Night's Dream, is the fact that Titania, the fairy queen, mind you, has fallen in love with an ass. <laughs> all right. So um, how all of this resolves itself, right? So in other words, do the young people find their true love, <laughs> right? Um, uh, Hermia's dad, right, does he ever relent, right? Does he ever allow Hermia to marry whom she wants? Uh, do the fairy king and queen make up, right? A lot of these questions I don't necessarily want to give direct answers to because I would like you to see the play and see how it all resolves itself. But what I will say is that this is a comedy, <laughs> right? And matters in Shakespearean comedies tend to work out pretty well and in a way that audiences will like. This is not a, a tragedy by any means. <laughs> so to return to my initial question, right? Why? has this play been so wildly successful, right, throughout the ages? Well, I think one of the, the answers has to do with the matter of audience, right? So Shakespeare's plays were viewed by people of different social classes, the working classes, the wealthy, the nobles, and the court alike, right? And um, when we think about it, people who don't have a lot of money, generally speaking, don't tend to go to live theater. Why? I haven't seen Hamilton yet, because I don't have 300 bucks to throw out there on the ticket, or however much it is. I think it is generally true that people who have a certain amount of wealth and privilege tend to be the ones who frequent live theater regularly now, right? And so people who don't have a lot of money, they tend to gravitate toward what? For live, enter well, live entertainment. Television and? Movies. Movies. Exactly. What's that? Festival 56. Uh, Festival 56, hopefully. <laughs> right, hopefully, hopefully. Um, but certainly when you think about the expense of Chicago theater, for example, oh my goodness. Right? I mean, people who are, who are really struggling paycheck to paycheck, they're not inclined to go to places like the Goodman or the Steppenwolf or the Lyric Opera of, of Chicago. Well, during Shakespeare's era, there was no TV. Right? There were no movies. And so the working classes, right, the lower classes, those who were struggling, they went to the theater as well. And they could pay the equivalent of a day's worth of wages to stand in the part of the theater that was referred to as the ground line, right, and see whatever the production was. And they did. And they did, right? And they went. Well, are the working classes represented in Midsummer Night's Dream? Yes. By whom? The mechanicals. Exactly, exactly. Are the wealthy represented? No. Yes, <laughs> right? By Aegeus, Demetrius, Lysander, Hermia, and, and Helena, right? What about the nobility? Yes, Duke. Right? We have the Duke, right? And, who, and then we also have actually the highest level in Elizabethan society, which would be Queen Hippolyta. Everybody is there. <laughs> Everybody is represented. And the language in the play is really very interesting. When the mechanicals are talking, what's being used is prose, almost like everyday language. When the wealthy, the nobles, the queen are speaking, most of the time it's going to be an elevated poetry, right? And so even the language that Shakespeare uses reflects the social classes. So the fact that the various social classes are represented, I think, is part of what makes this play great and part of its appeal, right? The fact that there is something there for everybody. Um, what else, right, helped to make this particular play so successful? Well, Shakespeare used elements of what we might consider to be pop culture, right, today. So when, when we refer to pop culture, we refer to things like television, right, radio, music, but he also used texts that educated people would have been familiar with. 
So to give you an idea of some of these things, um, and I already mentioned it was a tradition of amateur actors to put on plays for their dukes. Right? And in Midsummer Night's Dream, it doesn't go very well. <laughs> right? The amateur actor is putting on a play for, for Duke Theseus. So in other words, Shakespeare is probably, right? We, and the reason I'm using the word probably is that I can't call him. Right? And ask him for sure if this is what he was doing. But he was probably making fun of some of those amateur productions and their very poor quality. <laughs> Right? So this is something that Shakespearean audiences would have, that Elizabethan audiences rather would have known. Right? He also was using characters well known to many Elizabethans. Right? So today, I tend to think that part of the reason that Peter Pan is so successful, right? So if, if a new Peter Pan film is going to come out, people are probably going to go see it. Well, why? We all know who Peter Pan is. Right? Something similar with Star Wars, Planet of the Apes. Right? These are stories that have infiltrated into our kind of cultural consciousness, right? Well, of course, the cultural consciousness of Elizabethan audiences would have been different. The Pyramus and Thisbe tale, right? The characters in the play within the play, um, Shakespeare most likely took his knowledge of this particular tale from Ovid's Metamorphosis, right? And it's commonly thought that many people in Elizabethan uh, England would have known this particular uh, tale. Theseus was a Greek hero that people would have known about. As, um, and Hippolyta, the queen of the Amazons, was also a character that Elizabethan audiences would have known. Shakespeare likely took uh, information about these characters from Plutarch's Lives of the Noble Grecians and Romans and Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales. I think sometimes when we think of Shakespeare, we think of him as being this tremendously original artist. But that is not true. <laughs> right? A lot of the tales, a lot of them that he wrote, came from sources, right? Came from specific places. And actually, one of his plays, um, The Two Noble Kinsmen, um, it, has, it has just been acknowledged that he was not the sole author, right? And um, it's a whole branch of Shakespearean studies, actually, to look at his various texts and to study historical documents and figure out which of his plays were actually co-written, right? Or heavily edited by other artists. And of course, because so much time has passed, and there's only so much historical evidence, there's only so much we can know, right? Um, at any rate, a kind of pop cultural element that he refers to in um, Midsummer Night's Dream has to do with May Day celebrations, right? So um, what exactly were those May Day celebrations during the Elizabethan era? Well, this was a folk tradition to celebrate the coming of the summer. And so I'm gonna quote Stephen Greenblatt here. What he says is, what might Will have participated in growing up in Stratford and its surrounding countryside? Men and women and children, their faces flushed with pleasure, dancing around a maypole, decked with ribbons and garlands, a young woman garlanded as flowers, with flowers as the Queen of May. Right? And in fact, when Theseus discovers, Duke Theseus discovers the four lovers in the woods toward the end of the play, what he says is, um, oh, they rose up early to observe the right of May. So what he thinks is that they're celebrating May Day, but they are not, <laughs> right? They are not at all. Um, two of them were escaping, you know, the, the will of Hermia's father, mm -hmm. and the other two um, are part of their own little lover's, <laughs> lover's uh, quarrel, shall we call it. Uh, well, anyway. Now, something else that Shakespeare was almost certainly playing with in Midsummer Night's Dream, right, in an element of pop culture, you might say, were the morality plays. The morality plays were um, actually very, very popular when Shakespeare was growing up, and he almost certainly would have seen a series of morality plays. Right? So what exactly were the morality plays? Well, they were terribly dull, I should say. And if you've ever read one, it was probably um, Every Man. Right? So what exactly is it? Well, I don't want to get too far into it, because like I said, it's not a very good um, genre of literature, but the whole point of them was to be um, very teacherly, to teach people how to live a good moral life. And the way that it would be, there's nothing wrong with that, that's not why they're bad, they're just, they just are. But, <laughs> but at any rate, um, you would have characters representing different virtues, for example, and in just about every morality play, there would be someone called the vice figure. All right. So to quote Greenblack, who is the vice figure? A jesting prattling mischief maker 
who embodied simultaneously the spirit of wickedness and the spirit of fun. Mm -hmm. By the end of the morality play, the vice figure would be defeated in every single one. <laughs> this is part of the reason I'm saying this was not a very good genre of plays. They were very, very predictable. Vice was always going to be defeated. <laughs> well, for those of you who know Midsummer Night's Dream, the jestling, prattling mischief maker who embodied the spirit of wickedness and fun, who does that kind of sound like? Puck. It kind of sounds like Puck. Right? And yet no moral judgment, I don't think, is given toward Puck. So in other words, Shakespeare, I don't think, necessarily means for us to say, oh, that Puck, he's just such a bad guy. I don't think that's it. Right? So this is not morality play by any means. Now also, bottom the mechanical who's turned into an ass. He's very proud. This is a very, very proud character, right? And he, he wants to play all the roles, bear in mind, in Pyramus and Thisbe. He is also a kind of vice figure who is mocked <laughs> throughout this particular play. Well, and after it's discovered, right, that um, Titania is in, in love with him, he totally takes advantage of the situation in a really humorous way. But his behavior is never punished, per se. Right? His pride is never punished, I don't think. It's never corrected. So what we have here is not a morality play, which is representing very traditional Christian values, right, for the Elizabethan era. What we have here is a kind of playing with that, almost poking fun of, that particular genre mm -hmm. in a very secular kind of way. Mm -hmm. Just a few more things. I feel I'm probably going over time, <laughs> so I'll, I'll be sure to, to wrap up quickly. Um, another reason why I think A Midsummer Night's Dream has been so successful and continues to be, and will be, right, in the future, I think that its themes are incredibly relevant today, just as much so today as they were during the Elizabethan era. I, I mentioned that Shakespeare, when he was writing this particular play, and Romeo and Juliet, he was almost certainly thinking about the uncooperative woman, right? And, and if, you, if you know Taming of the Shrew, right? Taming of the Shrew was, um, I believe, his first work, right? That scholars, many scholars believe it was his first work. <laughs> and so he was thinking about the uncooperative woman from ver very, very <laughs> early on, right? And reflecting on, on gender roles. And so what does he represent here? Well, he represents two characters, right? Titania, as well as Hermia, who are stretching the boundaries of acceptable behavior for a woman. <laughs> One of them gets what she wants, right? The other, not so much, right? So, and again, I, I hesitate to reveal it. It's Titania, right? She loses the Indian boy that she so desperately loves. Oberon gets him. Oberon's plan works. So what do we make of all of that? I don't know. You know, is Shakespeare saying women should just do what men say? Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so at all, right? But could he perhaps be pointing out that for women during the Elizabethan era, it didn't always work out as they would like? I think so. Um, parental consent in marriage and relationships, I think, is something else that Schaefer was thinking about as he was working on A Midsummer Night's Dream. After all, it is Aegeus, right, who does not want Hermia to marry the man of her choice. And what happens at the end, well, again, I'm trying to withhold, right, um, some of the surprise, but I will say it's a happy ending for Hermia. <laughs> it's a happy ending for Hermia. Um, is this theme as relevant today as it was during Elizabethan England? Well, I think in the civil rights movements, right, where you would have one white person, one black person wanting to marry and parents saying no, that certainly that theme was just as relevant then as it is today. And I tend to think that certainly there are instances where parents will say, no, I don't want you marrying so-and-so. Right? Well, what does Shakespeare think about all that? I've seen Midsummer Night's Dream. Or Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> right? Yes. It, it never seems to work out very well when a parent says no to, um, to a person that, that a child wants to marry. No. Love. 
right? In Midsummer Night's Dream, we have a kind of extended reflection on what love is, right? What exactly is it? Why does it strike some but not others, right? Is there a pattern to it? Is there rhyme or reason? How is it that it's so fickle, <laughs> right? It's here one minute, gone the next, right? Well, I think the whole play reflects on this particular issue. And there is one monologue in the, um, let's put a soliloquy really, there's one soliloquy in the play that I think stands out among all the rest in terms of summing up um, Shakespeare's feelings on love at this particular time, and it's actually given by Eleanor. I don't want to quote the thing in full because it's huge, but these are just a full line, a, a few lines, right? Through Athens, Helena says, I am thought as fair as Hermia. But what of that? Right, so in other words, she's as beautiful as Hermia. But what of that? Demetrius thinks not so, right? Demetrius thinks that Hermia is more beautiful. That's who he appears to be in love with. He will not know what all but he do know, right? So in other words, this is his business, no one else's. Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind, right? The mind. So in other words, it's within whom we love, who we do not. And therefore is winged Cupid painted blind. Nor hath love mind of any judgment taste. So in other words, love has no judgment. <laughs> right? There's no intellect here who we fall in love with and who we don't. Wings in no eyes symbolize incautious haste. Right? So that's not the exact language. The, the exact line is, wings in no eyes figure unheedy haste. Right? But the way I read that is that for Cupid, Right? Um, he's absolutely incautious, right? And uh, acts in haste. People can fall in and out of love very, very quickly. Now, something else, and this is the last major subject of the play that, that I want to touch on, right? And again, I'm, I'm trying to think about things about this play that have stayed with us through the ages, right? Is um, the metaphysical, dreams, the nature of reality. Plato wrote, how can you prove whether at this moment we are sleeping and all our thoughts are a dream, or whether we are awake and talking to one another in the waking state? Mm -hmm. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, we wake from one dream into another dream. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there are those Matrix movies. Mm -hmm. Right? Where, let's see, we're all just living in a matrix, a digital matrix while our bodies are lying somewhere else and being used as batteries. So what is real, what is not? What are dreams? These are questions that perhaps cannot be fully explained by science, right? And I, I think one of the points that this play is making about the metaphysical is that the metaph metaphysical does impact reality. Elements that we can't fully wrap our brains around and understand impact us every day, right? So do the fairies, for example, who are part of the metaphysical and midsummer night's dream. Do the fairies impact human lives and events? Do they change the course of characters' lives? The answer is absolutely. A Midsummer Night's Dream is a play that triumphs the metaphysical, right? Acknowledges and triumphs it, even as it makes fun of those morality. That's all I have for you today. <laughs> I hope I, uh, yeah, thank you.